We have a few people attending today who indicated that they are new to the FDP program and would like to learn more. The FDP Institute provides world-class training and education to financial professionals to meet the accelerating needs of digital transformation in the industry. Registration for the April exam opens on December 11th. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar as I turn it over to Dr. Hossein Kazimi, Senior Advisor for Kaya Association and the FDP Institute. Thank you for moderating our session today with Z. Abraham. Welcome, Hossein. Well, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, good morning, uh, good afternoon for people who have uh, joined us. We are very happy to have Z. Abraham here to talk about two really important topics. One is big data, uh, data analytics, and of course the other one ESG and basically how combined they can provide solutions to us. Uh, Z. Abraham is an FTP charter holder, and so we are very happy to have him here. He has a long career in asset management, ESG, and derivatives. He has worked as a consultant with uh, Capital Group, and before that, Infosys Consulting. And right now, he's associated with uh, Veranzo uh, Consulting Solutions. So we are happy to have him, and uh, the floor is yours, as they say. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. Uh, hope you are able to hear me. So yes, I hear you, yes. we'll dive into the topic, uh, harnessing the power of data for ESG investing. So this is kind of a critical juncture where both ESG as well as uh, AI is the talk of the town everywhere. Let me go on to the next slide here. So what we would cover today is around ESG investing uh, some bit of uh, what the overall scope of ESG data is, the challenges around ESG data, because there is vast amount of data everywhere. And in trying to overcome those challenges, can AI be of any help? And at the end, we would uh, take a bit of time for any question and answers. So what is really ESG investing? So ESG investing uh, is typically when you invest your money in companies that are committed to creating a positive impact on the world. Essentially, where you consider alongside other financial factors, uh, ESG considerations or factors into the overall investment decision process. And by doing so, you are trying to identify opportunities and uh, mitigate any risk that is coming in as a part of uh, some of the company's practices. Moving on, so the key, uh, some of the key criteria or factors that is used by sustainable investors across the globe, across these three pillars of ESG, environmental, social, and governance. So for example, if you look at environmental, some of the common things that you would see is uh, around climate change, methane. So these are, these two are, probably the topmost priority that you would have, uh, you would be hearing across. There are other topics like water use and conservation, biodiversity. On the positive side, you would have clean technology and uh, clean energy. Those are topics around environmental considerations that uh, you would see. In terms of social aspects, uh, human rights, just transition, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, workplace benefits. So those are kind of the primary or the key ones that you would uh, look at when you look at ESG investing. And the third pillar is not much uh, of, uh, it has not gained so much of prominence, but it's still very important in terms of governance, uh, what each of those companies do when you look at uh, what you would recently hear more around uh, funds coming up with good governance. And when you talk about good governance or governance overall, it is around tax fairness, uh, board independence, anti-corruption policies, uh, res being responsible in their uh, political lobbying, the whole purpose of what the organization exists for and how it is defined and whether the companies are actually following through on those definitions. Executive comp uh, compensation is another major topic that you would hear uh, in major news headlines and things like that. 
So there are different ways that you could uh, look at including ESG consideration into your investment process. Some of the key ones is what we would discuss in the next couple of slides. So one aspect that you could look at is uh, having a positive screening, which effectively is selecting investments that meet certain ESG criteria that you would set. For example, if you want to target your uh, investments towards uh, any sustainable, sustainable development goal, uh, so in the slide, you can see uh, two of the sustainable development goals highlighted in the picture on the left, which is good health and well-being. And there is another one on decent work and economic growth. So these are some examples which you could look at in terms of positive screening, what you would want to target. Some other considerations would be like uh, looking at lower uh, lowering your carbon footprint or the greenhouse gas emissions, looking at positive uh, aspects like use of renewable energy, looking at investing in companies which has a diverse board and companies with great human policies, human rights policies. On the contrary side, if you look at negative screening as a way of ESG investing, this mainly emphasizes on uh, screening out companies or limiting your exposure to objectionable or unsustainable economic activities rather than just focusing on the positive aspects. So here you would exclude mainly uh, targeting on certain involvement of these companies like in tobacco manufacturing, distribution, retailing, things like that. Or uh, for example, if a company is a weapons manufacturer, if they are involved in fossil fuels, uh, al distribution of alcohol or manufacturing of alcohol, gambling, et cetera, right? So these are mostly based on certain beliefs that investors would have or uh, things like uh, where you don't want to be exposed to certain activities because you don't really uh, like those activities. So those are like, uh, it would also be defined by, so this is fr from a personal investment standpoint, but when you look at larger mutual funds or asset management companies, then you look at what is actually considered in your product or the product design, what is disclosed on the prospect is what is your mandate. And those mandates would be clearly stated and you just have to follow through by implementing negative screening processes, which would eliminate or uh, kind of limit your exposure to those companies. Another key way of looking at ESG investing would be to aligning with- hey, Could uh, I ask you a question, quick question? Sure, uh, Dr. Sanders. Just from your perspective, which of those two you think is more effective in terms of promoting uh, the ESG sort of goals, the negative ones or the positive, or is probably case specific? It's uh, case specific to some extent. If you look at uh, fund mandates, if you have clearly outlined what negative uh, screens that you would deploy, then you would have to follow that. But when you go to this, uh, the higher objective of looking at sustainable investments, not just screening out uh, uh, or limiting exposure to some things that you don't want to, but if you look at sustainable investments, that is a level up, right? So there you are positively screening as to uh, what companies you want to invest because they uphold the future in a sustainable way, right? So that's right. kind of the distinction. And then there are products, uh, uh, which mostly if you look at across negative screening is easier to implement, but positive screening is difficult because you will have to research through and identify those companies which are actually making commitments and then actually uh, taking that effort to uh, realize those commitments over a period of time. I understand. Uh, how about the market size? I mean, if I'm a large, say, sovereign wealth fund, uh, is it sort of, do, do I have more choices in terms of negative screening or positive? I mean, my guess probably would be negative, but uh, you know more than, more than I do, yeah. Right, so overall, I think uh, uh, there are different classifications from the product and then sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, all of them, uh, some of them invest directly or use other asset managers to make investment decisions for them. So mm -hmm. overall, if you look at it, negative screening is easy to implement. Uh, because it's kind of 
uh, not allowing certain uh, exposure within your portfolio. Positive screening, you have to be more uh, investment research oriented. You have to have a good team looking at uh, the details. You have to have uh, comprehensive data to give you a snippet of uh, diverse things across ESG factors and what all you would have to then aim for in terms of positive sustainable uh, criteria. All right, makes sense, thank you. Welcome. Moving on, one uh, key thing, this can be particularly used when you look at positive aspects, uh, which is to align uh, to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this is kind of global. So the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals typically looks at uh, addressing some of the world's most pressing problems. And uh, if you go through on the left-hand side here, the different goals are outlined. So these are irrespective of which country, it's global, right? So the overall aspect here is there are 17 goals uh, that UN is targeting for or uh, having the sustainable objectives for, as well as uh, when you look at the details, there are 169 targets and there are further nuances to all of this. But the key thing here is uh, if you look at government spending and development assistance, that contributes up to about uh, $1, $1 trillion per year, which is not sufficient to address all of these uh, 17 goals. And there's like the uh, 2020, 2030 agenda, which is what uh, I have quoted here uh, from the Secretary General of United States, uh, Nations. So the financing gap, uh, which is where the private sector and investment managers and investment uh, asset owners will step in to either redirect existing uh, capital or by making new allocations to uh, these goals so that you can be better aligned from a in sustainable investment standpoint and overall help the world solve for some of the greatest problems that we are facing uh, currently. The last one in terms of the investment criteria that we are looking at, uh, there are many other options that you have, but the last one that we will talk about on the slide is uh, climate change. Climate change is on top of everybody's mind. And as we are speaking, there is the COP28 or the Conference of Parties, which is organized by UN uh, FCC uh, in Dubai this year, and it's underway. There are a lot of commitments that are being made in terms of addressing climate change issues. And the key aspect here is you have to be in a pot in a portfolio. You will have to be looking at what are the climate change uh, policy risks, uh, the physical risks, and the transition risks that your portfolio will be exposed to, and integrate the uh, data that is relevant to support that analysis and make investment decisions, so that you would be in a better place to uh, look at allocating your capital, uh, mitigating these risks from a short term and a long term standpoint. Now we will briefly touch upon some of the regulations that uh, are governing ESG investing. So this is again global, a lot of regulations are coming up across different countries, but the two areas or two jurisdictions that we are focusing on is United States and European Union. In the US, if you look at uh, recently, there has been a update to the SEC fund naming rule where it states that at least 80% of value of your investments should be in the investment focus that the name suggests, right? So this is one primary reason where you would see a lot of companies are kind of uh, either uh, updating the names of the funds to take out some of the investment focus that was previously disclosed just for the reason that 80% uh, of your investments within the portfolio might not be aligned to what the name was previously. There is also uh, 
the DOL 401k plan ESG guidance, which is another debatable topic wherein uh, in the US particularly, you have been hearing that uh, when you look at incorporating ESG factors into uh, the ESG investing process or the overall investment process, you cannot uh, discount the uh, objective, primary objective or the fiduciary responsibility that you have as a fund manager in terms of looking at or providing uh, superior long-term results for your investors. So those are kind of the major ones which is impacting sustainable fund naming and the allocation to sustainable funds within the US. So there is this could be probably attributed to uh, like the decline that you see in sustainable fund investing within the US or the allocation to sustainable funds within the US. The, in the European Union, it's uh, more broader. There is a much more uh, optimism across, and this is not just uh, EU, but even in Asia, investors are more demanding for uh, funds or investment options which are more sustainable. So within EU, there are a lot of uh, uh, regulations. One of the common one that you would hear is about the sustainable fund finance disclosure regulation or what is normally called as SFDR. So this is ideally not a, a labeling regulation, which means this is not typically promoted to label a fund, but it is more of a disclosure regulation but it is kind of interchangeably used and there are more regulations coming up in terms of supporting what standard naming could be applied for different funds so that you have a consistent way of looking at the objectives of different funds. Then you also have uh, alongside SFTR, the EU taxonomy, which uh, kind of looks at uh, economic activities that qualify as environmentally sustainable. You have uh, other regulations which are more recent and there's a, a upcoming one. So the CSRD or the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive is a recent one. And there is the new one which is coming up, which is the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. So across, if you look at uh, the regulations remain fragmented across uh, different jurisdictions. Uh, this is kind of difficult uh, when you look at having a common language, which fund managers would have to uh, review and implement across different regions that they are operating in. Moving on, we have, this is kind of high level representation of some of the key players uh, in terms of standard setting, uh, framework development, and uh, some of the impactful and influential stakeholders in the space. So if you'd see these is ESG is kind of across nations, global, and therefore you have a lot of uh, UN bodies uh, involved in setting certain standards, uh, frameworks, and helping the uh, global nations address or focus on some of these problems and channelize uh, government's uh, expenditure as well as uh, encourage private investments into the space promoting to solve for some of these challenging problems. And uh, on the lower side is the ESG ratings frameworks, which uh, by itself uh, I have called out just for the reason that this is kind of uh, something that could give a high level picture of uh, companies similar to what credit rating agencies do. You could have either letter categories or some numerical uh, scores, which would easily enable you to place companies and compare them against each other, either within the same industry or uh, across industries. We will briefly touch upon the fund flows just to give a insight of uh, how it is uh, as per the latest quarter uh, in 2023. So overall, uh, sustainable fund assets stands at uh, about 2.74 trillion, which uh, 
is as of uh, September 2023. As we spoke about uh, in one of the previous slides around regulations, due to greenwashing acquisitions and uh, regulatory tightening, there are uh, funds in the US which are kind of reorienting themselves to take out uh, the particular focus areas which was previously uh, maybe more focused on ESG aspects. Now they are trying to take it out because of the naming rule that we earlier touched upon. So even in terms of numbers, there are more numbers that I could share. So there is the GISA or Global Sustainable Investment Alliance uh, report for 2022 that came out, which uh, parks the overall investment in sustainable investing assets at uh, 30.3 trillion across the globe. And from a growth aspect, uh, they are saying uh, since 2020, excluding US, there is like an overall 20% growth in sustainable investing assets. And the most common strategies that, uh, as per that report, is uh, corporate engagement and shareholder action is, is the first one, followed by ESG integration and negative screening. There is also the, if you want to hear about from the global perspective in terms of what the size for equity and uh, uh, debt markets are, equity markets today stands at about uh, 106 trillion US dollars. And uh, the Institute of International Finance uh, talks about the global debt size uh, for Q3 at uh, 307 trillion, of which uh, uh, I think from a different report it's, talks about uh, about 100 trillion being the government uh, debt across different countries. Moving on to the ESG. Uh, I have a question here, actually. You mentioned greenwashing. Maybe you'll come back to it. But uh, do I, it seems that we are seeing more of an effect in US than in Europe. Is that correct? Or just uh, sort of the data is? No, I think good. in the US is where it is uh, a topic of more debate. Uh, so primarily, all this while, we have been hearing that uh, uh, fund managers should not discount ESG factors and impact the returns that would uh, come to the investors by focusing right. on sustainable activities or sustainable allocations, right? And that has been the primary topic of debate all these years. And now, SEC coming up with this naming rule, uh, it is not just limited to ESG funds, but ESG funds is more impacted because that has been an emerging space which has grown rapidly across the last five, 10 years. Right, mm -hmm. And any industry that has grown rapidly, once regulation steps in, they will have to reevaluate, recalibre, and then adjust your uh, activities so that you are more in line with regulations. And with the naming, 80% uh, naming rule coming in, uh, you don't have a leeway there. You have to adhere to the regulation, and therefore, I think that's kind of impacting it. Greenwashing is more about uh, what you say, like... Uh, over promising and under delivering. If you're yes. almost, you are promising that uh, you are more of a sustainable fund, it should not be misleading to the investors uh, once they step into a fund, right? So there are costs to step in, step out, but, uh, and uh, yeah, it should not be misleading because it should, maybe it aligns with the investors objectives, therefore they want to invest. But if the name just suggests that you are not really into it, mm -hmm. that is like over promising and under delivering. Yes. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay. So when it comes to data, ESG data is kind of uh, everywhere. It's kind of difficult to get to what you really need because uh, even the space has been emerging, the data aspects are emerging, disclosures are still evolving. And there are no standards across the globe in different countries where companies will have to disclose what is required to support uh, the aggregation of ESG data and therefore feed into uh, ESG investing. So the data also has both uh, quantitative and qualitative 
uh, information that is required to to be synthesized so that investors can look at uh, data and not be overloaded with data, but look at key aspects and then uh, make their decisions. So this is kind of a high level flow of what is, uh, or how the data is delivered to asset managers and asset owners, right? So on the left-hand side, you would see company disclosures were, uh, or the left-hand side is more of uh, the sources from where data can be collected. You have company disclosures like annual reports, corporate sustainable, uh, corporate uh, social responsibility uh, reports, websites, exchange filings. And you also have uh, responses from companies in terms of uh, uh, answers to investor queries, uh, disclosures for information requests and news uh, that is coming in or coming out of companies. There are also a lot of alternate sources of company data that is available through social media or other uh, general websites or uh, nonprofit organizations who do research or other institutional other uh, firms that conduct research in different sectors. All this kind of comes into the central area where you have either uh, major ESG data providers in play like MSCI, Morningstar, uh, Bloomberg, ISS. There are also uh, like uh, non-standard specific to ESG uh, players like CDP. And there are also the alternative open sources that we previously mentioned. In terms of looking at high level, you could see ESG rating providers, uh, MSCI, Morningstar, uh, London Stock Exchange Group, ISS, et cetera. And there are ESG indices, which are uh, specifically created to track sustainable investments. Uh, some of the key ESG indices providers are MSCI, Bloomberg, S&P, FTSE, Russell. And this data is all provided. And of course, there is a uh, there are fees for subscribing to these data sets. And again, if you look, if you enroll for FTP, you would also learn one interesting aspect of how data providers uh, charge uh, the fees for each of the data sets, depending on uh, the assets under management or how the data is used within uh, the potential customers for those data. So asset owners uh, is basically uh, the people who actually uh, have the money to uh, invest. So like individual investors, pension funds, insurance companies, uh, sovereign wealth funds that Dr. Hussain was uh, referring to earlier. Uh, asset managers are the ones who then manage the money on behalf of uh, those asset owners. Some of the big names there are like uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, Capital Group. These are in the US and then you have uh, other global players as well. So when you look at uh, ESG, or one more thing that I wanted to mention about here is like uh, uh, with AI emerging, unlike what you have seen or what I've called out here is more of the traditional data players with AI, there are a lot of new entrants into the space uh, using AI and having uh, data solutions or data options being made available to a lot of clients. And the data is everywhere across the globe. So harnessing that data, bringing all that together uh, as a data product or a op offering is uh, kind of stream being streamlined. And that is why you would see a lot of uh, new emerging companies using AI in the space. When we go into ESG data products, I wanted to uh, take the example of MSCI, which of course is a market leader in the space in terms of structured uh, data that is being provided to support uh, ESG investment decisions. There are thousands of data points which actually power this integration of uh, ESG considerations into the overall investment management process. 
So each of these data sets potentially is like uh, having 100 uh, to 400, 500 factors. And some of the key ones are ESG ratings, which kind of look at uh, overall, uh, the key one there would be within that would be the overall, either the letter rating or an overall uh, integer score that you could use for uh, evaluating a company. ESG controversies talks about uh, how uh, the company's performance and adherence to international norms and principles are, or whether those companies have been involved in major ESG controversies. Climate change is a data set which uh, I think most firms involved in ESG investing would have to uh, take up because that is one key focus area as we discussed before. Climate value at risk or CVAR uh, is more of uh, uh, a forward-looking uh, aspect which provides you uh, data points to look at uh, evaluating policy risks or physical risks or transition risks in uh, addressing climate action. Business involvement screening and global sanctions is something which is typically used when you look at uh, negative screening, where you would want to look at how companies are involved in different uh, 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 spaces which are not really uh, positive. And there is also the aspect of how you would evaluate or screen out those companies. It could be if those companies are involved or it could also be because uh, you would set a criteria of certain uh, revenue threshold or max revenue percentage that you would want to look at from uh, excluding investments on specific companies in those areas. Sustainable impact metrics is uh, likely you could use it for a positive screening aspect if you look at the alignment to UN Sustainable Development Goals, as we discussed before. ESG fund ratings is more uh, the overall rating of uh, different funds that is being covered in the space. And even within uh, your process, you could look at how the different funds in your overall offering is uh, being looked at from a market standpoint or an independent uh, ratings provider standpoint. You could also look at how your competition is faring and then what are those aspects that they are more focused on so that uh, if you want to adjust your course, then you have an opportunity there. EU sustainable finance is more of a data set that helps address some of the regulatory uh, re disclosure requirements within EU, as we talked about the SFDR, EU taxonomy, those are uh, as well as MIFID. So those are like uh, key regulations that uh, this data set helps support uh, to kind of use the data, synthesize, and then look at portfolio level or uh, uh, holdings level, portfolio level, or the entity level disclosures that are required for these regulations. When we look at uh, investment activities uh, from a uh, value chain perspective. So there are different activities that you can see here, but the key here in terms of uh, data is to have a good data infrastructure, typically a data lake that would integrate with all the different platforms uh, so that you would have the benefit of trusted data in the overall investment process irrespective of where in the process it is. Otherwise, if data is kind of siloed and fed into different uh, capabilities, then you would have a problem uh, wherein some of the data might not be in sync uh, to what some of these other capabilities might be using. It's a good question. Um, alternative data could be uh, expensive. Uh, and, uh, what, what is the what is the our data in general could be quite expensive. Uh, what is the sort of right approach or what would you recommend for a small fund that wants to get into this space but probably just doesn't have the resources to acquire data? Is, is there sort of, can be outsourced? Uh, can it be rented? I mean, what's, what's the right approach there? Typically the pricing is kind of differentiated pricing within the space. Uh, so if you are a small firm, you 
definitely data providers want to sell their data, right? Uh, so uh, disclosing or even they would be aware if you're a small firm. So you would have a better pricing compared to a large asset manager who might be paying much more because there are limitations in terms of uh, how the data is used within the enterprise once you buy this data, even though uh, how uh, the data providers track that is a question. But if you're a small asset manager, you have different options. You can start with internal research uh, or typically regulations uh, provide you dis different options. Like you can have your own internal research, uh, figure out what are the critical ESG metrics that you would want to evaluate for your uh, investment decision process. So if you're just look looking at negative screening, you might want to just focus on uh, buying, say, for example, one package out of the entire set of offerings, right? So depending on what your mandate is, you could pick and choose. Then depending on the size of your investment firm, you could always kind of try to negotiate because even the data providers understand that for them uh, to earn the fees uh, data, uh, for these data products, the firm, the investment manager should also be able to uh, to be able to support or have that uh, kind of spend capacity so that they could pay for this product to be used in their process. So there is always like the differentiated pricing, which as long as you're aware, you should have the room for negotiation. And then there's the limitations that the data providers apply. So you could uh, figure out how you want to kind of structure all that into your contract. Thank you. So, Going into the investment process, we talked about the data infrastructure and the data lake. Uh, you, you can see there are different kind of research activities uh, within the ESG space that you could have or focus on, like exclusionary screening or the negative screening, materiality analysis tape based on the industry sectors. You could have a, a watch list or a red flag list. You could have other norm space screening uh, based on OECD norms or other uh, global norms that are out there. You can have certain models being developed which would uh, look at some of the aspects within ESG considerations, which could be, uh, uh, I think, which could become proprietary for your firm, depending on how you want to look at uh, and implement it across the investment decision process. In one another area is stewardship, as I talked about uh, the Global uh, Sustainable Investment Alliance uh, in their report says that uh, stewardship or more around the engagement activities is what active stewardship is what is uh, considered as one of the primary and leading ESG strategies uh, that is there today. So here you typically engage with companies to influence as a fund manager, you have a great amount of influence that you can exert on uh, companies to align with some of their commitments or make future commitments and make progressive action or take progressive actions uh, towards uh, attaining some of those commitments that they have either disclosed or are willing to commit to. Of course, stewardship is uh, sometimes a slow process, but it takes uh, 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 regular follow-up and continuous engagement to uh, get action. And collectively, if you look at uh, different investment managers looking at and reaching out to companies and trying to influence them to move in a positive direction would overall change the uh, trend and get things in line with uh, a sustainable future. Portfolio construction, uh, you can bring in snippets or uh, overview of uh, or have dashboards uh, that can help with portfolio review analysis and uh, how you want to allocate uh, uh, your investments there. Risk management and compliance, again, is a key area uh, where you can apply some of the rules uh, and uh, ensure that your fund mandates or prospectus uh, uh, disclosures are aligned, uh, adhered to and client mandates are followed. Reporting of, as a large space were uh, mostly driven by uh, 
regulations, but you would also have client demand in terms of uh, specific things that clients would want to uh, view on how sustainable your investment process is uh, in terms of what the locations are, how it is being done, and they would demand uh, uh, some amount of uh, transparency through reporting into what the process is. So moving on, uh, the issuer uh, ESG ratings methodology. So maybe we might, have, I was just looking at the time, we might have to press through a little bit. Uh, so MSCI, uh, I'm giving it two examples here. So one is uh, MSCI's uh, rating methodology, looking at the three pillars. They have uh, broken down that into 10 themes and then 33 ESG key issues there. And Overall, they arrive at uh, 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 industry adjusted score as well as uh, a score or a rating, letter rating, similar to what you would see in terms of credit ratings, which is more of uh, something which investors are familiar with. You also have uh, an example here from London Stock Exchange Group. Uh, they have a different framework. They also, uh, they have, they are considering like uh, 10, categories, uh, three in en environmental, four in social, and three in governance. And they also look at uh, controversies across all of those 10 categories in arriving at the uh, ESG score and the ESG controversy score, then which is uh, then combined into a ESG combined score. Just to give a uh, example of, uh, this is an another uh, publicly, uh, publicly available source for maybe not uh, relevant for a fund manager who would might who might need more details. But if you look at personal investments, this is a space that you could query to get an understanding of uh, at least a high level understanding of what uh, some of the companies that you want to invest in are looking at from an ESG standpoint. So you have. Uh, publicly available sources like MSCI's ESG ratings and climate search tool and Sustainalytics uh, company ESG risk ratings, which you can search for and then identify how those companies are faring. In this case, uh, Tesla, if you look at, has an overall MSCI rating of A, whereas Microsoft has a AAA. And then uh, if you uh, look at this, send apart here so you can see uh, Tesla is a ESG leader in opportunities in clean tech. But if you compare with Microsoft, even though from a different industry, they are ESG leader in uh, more spaces like uh, privacy and data security, human capital development, and uh, lower carbon emissions. The, on the contrary, on the other side, if you look at the risk ratings from Sustain Analytics, it is a, a numerical rating uh, and uh, Microsoft is placed at uh, lower risk overall, whereas uh, uh, Tesla is placed at a medium risk overall. So similar to the company ratings, uh, you also have publicly available MSCI source where you can uh, look at fund ratings across different funds. So this, uh, on the left side, you have American Funds New Economy Fund, which uh, is at a lower carbon emission compared to uh, the weighted carbon, weighted average carbon intensity for uh, Paranus Core Equity Fund, which uh, this one is particularly a ESG fund, one of the largest ESG funds in the globe. Uh, and the American Funds New Economy Fund is not a targeted ESG fund, but if you look at the uh, carbon exposure risk, then uh, American Funds New Economy Fund uh, has a lower risk uh, or a lower carbon exposure. Moving on uh, with UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, and the importance of data here. So if you look at uh, indicators with internationally agreed methodology over the last uh, uh, seven or eight years, there is a good amount of traction there. And now more indicators are available or 100% of the indicators that are required for tracking 
the 17 sustainable goals are available and then the number of data records is also growing. So here is what I would say like, uh, there is more amount of, uh, so overall, I think uh, the government spending is around $1 trillion, but uh, the need is about five to $7 trillion per year. And uh, that gap is what we were talking about in terms of having the private sector and investment managers uh, looking at sustainable investment allocations to address some of those needs. We can briefly cover the ESG data challenges next. Uh, so in terms of uh, understanding the investor data expectations, there is a need to uh, improve the quality of data available because uh, when you look at investment management firms, most cases you're looking at uh, investments in uh, global companies, not just restricted to one area. And you need to have uh, a better quality of data. You have uh, different quality metrics that you could uh, look at standard quality metrics. And if, you, if your quality is good, your cost is down and you would have to focus on improving quality. There is a need for expanded coverage uh, as this is a global uh, aspect and getting data from across the globe is a challenge. And the expectation is to have a better coverage across different regions and different markets. Uh, you also need granular data to help make a certain decisions so that you're not uh, looking at some high level aspects, but you also know the details when you want to make informed decisions. Uh, there's also an expectation around uh, having historical data for back testing purposes and uh, other trend analysis, and also the need to have futuristic data so that you could uh, look at future state projections and uh, make uh, or discover opportunities which you can make full use of. Questions, uh, I know we are running short, but this is very interesting. So is it, is it fair to say that, uh, you know, you just touched upon it, lack of uh, not having enough historical data to do extensive back testing, does this kind of uh, prevent us from creating maybe more active strategies? In other words, this kind of uh, biases us towards uh, kind of a buy and hold or long-term strategies. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think uh, typically uh, when you look at uh, back testing, you generally look at the uh, optimization process, right? And uh, what you uh, want to look at there is uh, how you want to look at, so if you are kind of trying to replicate uh, certain strategies, that is where it kind of uh, plays an important role in terms of uh, of finding the fund dispersion between the two strategies, what you are trying to mirror versus what you want to kind of uh, uh, benchmark against the reference fund. Mm -hmm. So that is one space. So I think, uh, yeah, you have the back, te back testing models, of course, is uh, something which you can adjust because based on data availability, more data, of course, is good. But mm -hmm. if, you have, if you have limited number of years of data from history perspective, then you will have to figure out how we want to adjust your models to make the best use of it. Right. I mean, I was thinking that, you know, if, if, you, if you are doing positive sort of screening and if you go back 10 or 15 or 20 years, you may not just find enough sort of positive screening firms that uh, you could include in your database and do back testing and, you know, look at what's the impact of increased volatility or some sort of a crash or dollar weakening or strengthening and so on all these macro events, how they would affect some of these uh, ESG companies. Uh, and in that regard, I thought maybe that it would impose some limitations on active management. Yeah, right. So yeah, for active management, I think, uh, yeah, it is kind of, uh, you have to supplement with a lot of uh, uh, current research mm -hmm. uh, to get things where you want to be, is what I would say on that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And then you have uh, you have the need to provision for overriding data because uh, some of the data that you would see from the data providers might not be might be based on what the company discloses, but then 
your research uh, points to uh, more insights where you want we might want to override or adjust the data uh, from those providers based on uh, what you what you know of how the company is performing uh, against some of the commitments. So let's, uh, in the interest of time, I think we might have to move on fast here. So incorporating the greatest challenges uh, within incorporating ESG data is around uh, data consistency and uh, it being resource intensive because there is a lot of data. You will have to identify what is relevant for you and then how you want to aggregate, cleanse, and interpret uh, that data. And even coverage, something that we talked about earlier. Uh, so in developed markets, you would find better coverage and for equities, you would find better coverage because those are listed and there are uh, disclosure requirements there. But when it comes to emerging markets and uh, 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 fixed income securities like sovereigns, uh, munis, uh, collateralized debt, et cetera, you don't have much of coverage there. So those are areas which uh, data providers are focusing on and more offerings are coming out. Then there is the rapid evolution of uh, these metrics and frameworks, which is constantly shifting. So therefore you have to be prepared to make adjustments as you go. Historical data, uh, uh, is uh, as we uh, as Dr. Hussain was also talking about uh, is a challenge which we will have to figure out how uh, we want to address that in our models. Fitment to define purpose is uh, how you make us of, uh, make use of all of this data, specifically when it comes to how your organization has defined its products and uh, what the client mandates are that you want to follow and what is really going to fit that particular set of needs that you would want to uh, look at in terms of uh, sustainable investing. Uh, overcoming data difficulties as invest, uh, you could invest in technology. This is the most promising space uh, with a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. You could analyze unstructured data, identify material ESG factors, specific to sectors and companies. And then uh, definitely there is a uh, lot of promising uh, things out there. You could also look at internal solutions uh, supplemented by internal research. You can have multiple data sources because uh, some of the data providers might have uh, different ways of different models and different ways of uh, gathering data and then producing that data. So you might want to compare with different sources rather than relying on one source. And the active engagements is uh, the most uh, uh, important one because that is what, as a fund manager or an investor, you have that influence which you want to uh, kind of make use of uh, in terms of allocating your funds after active engagements with those companies. And then you kind of uh, align with those companies on what they need to do, how we want to kind of push them to do it. Can AI help us? A big question. And of course, I think AI can always uh, act as an assistant to a lot of the things that we do. And when it comes to the data landscape, instead of being overloaded with data, the investors can definitely make use of AI in terms of uh, focusing on key data aspects, which would then allow them to uh, make important decisions based on what is relevant and not be uh, fully emerged into data and uh, not able to pick up significant factors which would influence and which would be promising to uh, make those decisions. So here we talk about the current state of AI, the trends in terms of uh, automation and augmentation of ex existing processes uh, for discovering new insights and making predictions from data. And the key uh, uses of asset uh, AI in asset management is predictive analytics, portfolio optimization, risk modeling, et cetera. And uh, the next two slides cover more around uh, what does uh, what are the tools and techniques that can be used for 
harnessing ESG data, the most common one, as you would see, is like the natural language processing, uh, which is what you, which is what uh, everybody would have seen over the last one or two years with uh, chat GPT gaining prominence and all that. Uh, the aspects of text summarization, uh, how you can implement machine learning, uh, how you can look at neural networks, uh, data validation, of course, is a key aspect in terms of identifying uh, issues with the data that you uh, get from either data providers or what you kind of uh, fetch from different disclosures. Sentiment analysis, uh, uh, the, some of these uh, are outlined and explained here. The slides will be available for you to reference. Uh, clustering analysis, uh, weighting algorithms, different forecasting models and uh, robotic process automation in terms of uh, checking for updates, uh, how you can integrate data more efficiently and uh, quickly. Uh, the slides is more around an end-to-end -end, uh, way of how to synthesize ESG data. Uh, the starting point, of course, is data collection. Then you will have data extraction and enrichment, data integration into the process, uh, overall uh, data analysis, and how at the end as well, uh, your investors would be actually looking at things and then how some of the business intelligence frameworks and tools can uh, be built up to help those uh, uh, synthesized ESG data uh, being provided to those investors to make those decisions. And uh, we, towards the end, uh, we want to just briefly touch upon the uh, laws and regulations governing use of AI in asset management. Uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, uh, FTC prohibiting false advertising. Uh, there is regulations about, uh, or the, there are in specific regulations about uh, misleading uh, 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 ways of disclosures, but it's more about the AI transparency, transparency and how you could explain some of the things if there are regulatory audits uh, or scrutinies there. There are uh, FINRA regulations which uh, uh, talks about rules of supervision, and that is where AI cannot run by itself, but you will have to have supervision, human supervision there. And uh, there's always the question around ethical aspects of AI. And one of the prominent thing that we would see is the EU GDPR compliance, which is an absolute requirement in EU where it protects uh, data privacy of individuals and of, uh, uh, yeah, of other areas where you have to uh, follow through on that. So these are like two things, one in EUIS and uh, one in the EU, where you have the EU AI Act, uh, which is more of a risk-based approach with uh, within a risk spectrum. And there is uh, the US ex uh, President's Executive Order on Safe, Secure, and Trustworthy Artificial Intelligence, all pointing to uh, like the importance of AI in the space, or overall AI, and then how it needs to be uh, having an ethical mindset to how it is applied. Before we close out, uh, the question is like, are you all ready to manage the uh, AI part or be managed by AI? And uh, what we are seeing from surveys is uh, from OECD disclosures, they are saying 63% of workers in finance are worried about job loss uh, in the next 10 years. And particularly what is interesting, apart from how companies are focused on retraining or upskilling, the question is to all of us, uh, how are we getting prepared, right? So, and that is where these are like two areas which are most promising, ESG as well as AI. And I have outlined a couple of resources here uh, for ESG, the PRA Academy offers certain courses and uh, CISA, uh, the Institute in the UK, which also use, uh, provides some good courses there. And more as uh, we talk about Dr. Hussain and uh, Kim would be uh, maybe outlining that uh, registration for FTP charter is coming up. Uh, this is where you have an in-depth learning opportunity 
around how AI can be used within asset management overall. And uh, you would learn a lot more about uh, starting from the basics in and uh, going through a lot of uh, use cases uh, that is part of the curriculum, which would be really great to uh, pursue. I would uh, leave it out there and then uh, I think we are up on time, but uh, we'll hand it back to Dr. Sain and Kim to uh, close out. Sure, thank you so much. Actually, perfect, right on time. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, very interesting, as you said at the very beginning, a very relevant uh, topic because both AI and ESG are, uh, are head headline grabbing uh, issues in the finance industry. So uh, I want to let again our audience know that uh, the the entire uh, slide deck and of course the presentation will be available shortly on our website. And of course you saw these con uh, contact information. Uh, I'm sure probably he'll be happy to respond to your inquiries about uh, this very interesting area. Again, thank you so much. Uh, I know it's early where you are, so have a, a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, also, I want to bring to attention of our uh, audience uh, an upcoming uh, webinar, uh, which sort of encompasses both uh, FTP and Kaya. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be on December 13th, and it's going to be moderated by our CEO, uh, Bill Kelly. Uh, also, look out for future uh, webinars from uh, FTP, uh, and uh, we hope to see you there. That's it for now. Thank you all. And thank you, Z. And thank you, Hussein. And we hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. We hope to see you on our registration begins on December 11th. Thank you all.